My name is Stephanie Walker. I'm the head of product at CEB. Uh, but before that, I was a civil litigator and um, here in California. And I had to do a lot of really kind of practical, tactical, targeted research on a deadline uh, for my clients, as I'm sure many of you have to do today. And because everyone's working from home these days and more and more people are moving from print to online when looking for their research tools, we thought it would be a really good opportunity to just give a refresher on some common sense uh, tips and tricks for legal research, and also kind of reframe how you should think about legal research when you're doing it. And I particularly thought it might be interesting for you to get the perspective of someone who not only used to practice, but who now develops online legal research tools. So you can kind of get that perspective on, on how we think about research tools and how we evaluate them. Um, and although I'll be using CEB as a uh, demo to illustrate some of these topics that we're going to talk about, all of the advice that you're going to hear today is equally applicable to any online research tool that you've got access to or that you subscribe to. So the agenda for today is really to talk about some common sense things that you can do to frame your legal research. Um, we're going to walk through some easy tips and tricks. Um, we're going to talk about why it's important for you to start with secondary sources, um, how to craft effective search terms, and yes, that will include a discussion of natural language versus Boolean terms and connectors. Um, we're going to talk about primary law and how to understand your case law citator and how to get more out of primary law research. And finally, we're going to loop back and talk about free versus paid resources, because I know um, we all use uh, free resources, which is great. They've absolutely got a place in your legal research uh, scheme, but you shouldn't get yourself into trouble by over relying on resources that aren't going to get you what you need. Um, so before we jump into secondary sources, I did want to give one overarching tip, which is that you should keep a really brief handwritten search log. And what I mean by that is not, you know, scribbling down in detail every single search term that you use and every single document that you look up. But if you keep a general handwritten log of the topics that you're researching and the types of resources that you're using, it actually provides a really great outline for you to look back over and decide whether or not you've missed anything and if there are any gaps in your research that you might want to fill in. It's also a really nice reference tool to have if you are searching more than one source. If you're searching some print, some online, some free sources, some news, um, some, you know, online legal database. Because if you do that, you don't have an overarching search history that you can rely on. So it's nice to have all of the research for a single matter on a single piece of paper for you to look back on and vet whether you've really done everything you wanted to do. So with that, let's start talking about secondary sources and why it's important for everyone's research to really start here, whether you're a beginner or you're really experienced. Um, I, don't, I don't know what law schools are teaching today because it's been a terrifyingly long time since I graduated from law school, but I do have a really clear memory of when I first graduated and I really started working, the disconnect between what law school taught me about legal research and how the partners that I worked for who were mentoring me expected me to do legal research. Um, on the job, you're really taught to, number one, read the case file or the matter file, get all the factual information that you need about your client. So you have that factual framework for your legal research. But the second thing you do, and the most important thing you do, is go straight to the secondary sources and read the chapter in the book that's most applicable to what you're researching. And there's a couple reasons why that's really important. One, it helps you frame the issues. It really gives you that background knowledge so you can research efficiently and help you identify corner cases or additional issues you hadn't considered yet. These books help you issue spot and help you think about different ways to research and different uh, aspects of research that you should be taking into account. It also can help you streamline your primary law research that you do later on. It can help you identify key cases and statutes. Um, the, if a case or a statute is ending up referenced in the secondary source, it's probably either very important or the seminal case on the issue or a really important statute. 
So it can give you a jump start in uh, understanding what uh, what are the primary law um, cases and statutes that you should be looking at when you get to that stage of your research. And finally, it gives you really useful terms of art that you can use. Um, there's a language in the law. We all know that there's certain terms and phrases that are used over and over again, but you might not be able to think of all of the different variations or alternate phrasings that you should be using in your search. So if you pay attention to the terms and the phraseology that's used in secondary sources, it can really help you zero in on uh, additional searches you should do within secondary sources and also give you really good search terms when you do turn to case law research. So let me give you a few examples of how this might work in practice, because I think practical examples are really uh, the best way to illustrate what we're talking about here. So give me just a moment to pull up the right screen. So what you should all be looking at right now is a search that I did in secondary sources in the CEB system. And um, let's say for the sake of argument that I am a business attorney and I spend most of my time drafting contracts and negotiating licensing agreements for my clients, but increasingly I'm getting uh, more questions from my business clients about employment issues and specifically about employee leave laws. So I want to research um, medical leave and how it's calculated. So I just searched under calculating medical leave and here's the page of search results that I'm getting. And when we talk about framing the issues, you can do that in secondary sources in an online tool without even clicking into any search results. Just by looking at the search results right here, I'm getting a wealth of really useful information and issue spotting. I'm figuring out that, okay, I have to worry about the length of leave and how I properly calculate leave. I'm starting to get really useful alternate search terms in this second result right here, I'm seeing that they use the phrase intermittent or reduced schedule leave for medical treatments. And maybe I was familiar with the phrase intermittent leave, but I wouldn't have thought to use the term reduced schedule leave when I was conducting a search. So right away, it's starting to give me some terminology that I can use that's really useful. It's also right away showing me what are the cases and statutes that are most applicable I'm seeing references to California's pregnancy disability leave law. I'm seeing references to the FMLA and CFRA, the Family Medical Leave Act, and the California Family Rights Act. So it's starting to focus me in on what is the law and what are the issues that I need to be covering to be able to answer my clients' questions. And if I actually click into a particular search result, let's say this first one, even more issue spotting, in a very short amount of time, I get really valuable framework for talking about what I'm doing and talking about the research that I'm doing. So here I see, again, some of the issues that I need to look at are how do I calculate the proper amount of medical leave? Um, I'm seeing that my employer may select between different leave options and how they calculate a 12-month leave year. So that's another issue that I need to talk to my, my client about. I'm seeing that the employer selection must be applied consistently and uniformly. Now I have to talk about consistency of application. I'm seeing that there's notice requirements where the employer must inform an employee of the applicable leave year um, that's being applied. So right away, just in you know five to 10 minutes, I'm seeing what my research framework is and what the major issues are that I need to discuss with my clients. If I tried to start from scratch and just trying to look up cases or statutes that dealt with this, it would have taken me so much longer. Um, but the great thing with online legal research is you can pull up these most relevant results in the click of a button. And if you pay attention to the right things, really get a good framework for the research that you're doing. Um, are there any questions about that, about secondary source research before we move on to another topic. We have one question. Um, sure. This question is, when doing research, could we focus on a specific state's law? Um, I'm not sure. I, uh, so I, I'm not 100% sure I understand the question. Um, if you're, I don't know if you're asking in a particular system or if you're asking um, just as a 
a practical matter of what, what best practices would be. Okay, that question was from an anonymous attendee. So if you want to jump back in yeah. and clarify your question, that'd be great. Uh, but we do have another question here. Oh, I think that's from that attendee. The example, for example, California's employment law. When do yeah, we so should Cody focus on a specific state's law? For example, California employment law. Well, I think. I mean, I, I think you should. I think so. Let me let me try and answer your question from a couple of different angles. Um, I think the more specific the research that you can do, the better. Um, obviously, it, it's dependent on the legal question that you're facing. If there are federal statutes and federal cases that are applicable to your question, obviously you should research those too. But if you're if if the legal issue that you're looking at does primarily involve California cases, then yes, absolutely, you should focus on um, on those questions and on the California law that's being specifically applied. Um, as to, you know, how to do that, you, I mean, it's just a matter of what you're using and the resources that you're using um, to get to get the job done. In, um, in the CEB system, for example, we're California focused. And so, um, this search was really already limited to California specific um, responses because I'm searching through CEB practice guides, which are California focused and deal with the, the state and federal issues that impact California lawyers. So part of making a good legal research plan is knowing what you've got and knowing what you're searching in the first place and knowing what filters you can apply. Um, I hope that answered your question. Mm -hmm. And so when you're doing a secondary source, um, Stephanie, you can get hundreds and hundreds of results. Mm -hmm. Do you have any tips on, you know, quickly finding the correct secondary source that you're looking for? Well, that's actually um, a really good segue into the next topic that we've got, which is crafting effective search terms. Um, so maybe let's talk a little bit about that and about what makes an effective search term. So, yeah, so I think to answer that question, you really have to talk about how, how to create a good search. Um, and no two search engines are exactly alike. Um, the results that you get are going to be dependent on a couple of different factors, um, including the system that you're searching and what content is included in that system, the algorithms being used to power both natural language or Boolean terms and connectors searches, and the choices that the engineers and product designers have made to determine relevancy rankings. Everybody is different. There's no kind of one true relevancy ranking. Um, so it's important to know what you've got and what you're searching and what the scope is. Um, but there's a couple things that I do think it's important to keep in mind when crafting a useful search term. And one of those is what we just talked about, which is using key terms and phrases from the secondary sources that you're getting. Um, unfortunately, so for the, the questioner that just asked, this doesn't help you because you're saying I need to get those good secondary sources searches in the first place. Then what I think you need to think about is um, really familiarizing yourself with how your research tool reacts to natural language versus Boolean terms and connectors. Um, what I'm about to say is probably going to be a little controversial for some of the people on this call, and that is that there are studies that show, including studies on legal search databases, that natural language is at least as effective as Boolean terms and connectors. And there's a couple reasons why that is. Um, first, people tend to make more mistakes with Boolean. They tend to, most people, I'm not saying you, I'm sure there are people on this call who are, you know, Jedi masters of Boolean terms and connectors, and they're perfect at it. But statistically, for most people, they don't really understand how they all work, and you tend to make mistakes, and you tend to not get back quite the search that you think you're getting. Um, the other reason that natural language search is often more effective is that when you're doing a natural language search, most people tend to put in more words. They tend to put in kind of a, a question or a long string of words. And having more words gives the search engine more information and more context clues um, to get you more relevant results. So I think going back to the question, um, one of the things that you might want to consider is playing around with longer natural language searches 
and um, see what you get. See if that works for you and gets you, um, at least in the first few pages, more relevant results or more of what you're looking for. Um, if you get 214 search results, honestly, who cares? Like no one, no one is going to read all 214 pages of search results. But what you really care about is that the first handful of pages are really, really highly relevant and that you're not missing anything that's really um, on point for what you're looking for. Um, so let me give an example of how this works in practice again. So I have pulled up a couple examples of a um, couple examples of uh, Boolean versus natural language searches in primary law. So here is a search result for building on the fact pattern we just had. I have searched published California appellate cases for wrongful termination and intermittent medical leave for those two exact phrases. And I got exactly one result, which is not a lot. Um, by contrast, when I did a natural language search that was longer, wrongful termination, intermittent medical leave, reduced schedule, there are probably some people who are tearing their hair out at how imprecise that search term is. But you can see what I got was 214 cases instead of one. And that first highly relevant case, Castro Ramirez, is still here, ranked really highly. But I also get a lot of other cases that are on point and that talk about medical leave issues in the context of a wrongful termination action. Um, and so again, what this tells me is I'm, you, you have to make that calculus between really getting precise Boolean search terms and limiting your results versus possibly foreclosing yourself off from highly relevant terms and being a little too restrictive. Now here in this um, page, I've got 22 pages of, of results. I'm not gonna read all 22 pages worth of case results. But what I am gonna do is scan through the first several, the first two or three pages of results where I'm getting highly relevant, highly focused results. Um, now, some people on this webinar might be thinking that, okay, sure, but her Boolean search wasn't very good. I would have done it better. I would have done it differently. Yeah, okay, that, that's probably a fair point. I can think of a bunch of different ways that I could have used Boolean terms and connectors and that I could have maybe made the search more effective. But the point is that you don't necessarily get better results by having more restrictive searches and the likelihood of you inadvertently making a mistake using Boolean is higher than if you use natural language searches where you might get more search results, but you're also likely in the first several pages to get highly relevant search results. So I think in general, in, in, in um, crafting effective search terms, um, take some time to play around with both Boolean terms and connectors and natural language searches in the systems that you use and see what you get. And I think also just in general, when crafting search terms, using alternate phrases and alternate phrasings, especially in natural language searches, is very useful and gives the search engine that kind of those context clues so that it can um, do a better job of returning what you're looking for. Uh, Google has made an impact on the way that the world searches. Um, most people use natural language searches. And the good news for legal databases is that the legal world has paid attention to that and over the decades has gotten much, much, much better at natural language searches. And so uh, a lot of companies, including CEB, have really spent a lot of effort at making sure that our natural language search is really good and is good at recognizing legal terms and concepts so that you are getting those highly relevant search results. Any questions about um, effective search terms or uh, Boolean versus natural language? Yeah, if you have any questions, feel free to um, submit them via the Q&A icon. We do have a few questions from earlier too, mm -hmm. Stephanie, if you don't mind. Great. Yeah, um, on one of your, on one of your uh, first slides, um, when you mentioned about, when you talked about starting with secondary sources and framing the issue, you, you recommended that folks identify corner cases. What do you mean by that? Okay. Um, yeah, so 
what I mean by corner cases is that um, if you're an experienced practitioner, um, well, for both beginners, experienced practitioners who are very familiar with a certain topic or even a certain motion or procedural issue um, may think that they have a really good grasp of the material. Um, and so they might not need to refer back to a secondary source because they get it. They know how these motions work. They, they know this general subject matter. They can jump straight into the case law. But what I mean by corner cases are kind of edge cases or scenarios or procedural issues that don't come up as often, but sometimes still do arise. And even whether you're a beginner or whether you're a very experienced researcher, it's always a really good idea to read through the chapter dealing with your procedural issue or your substantive issue to make sure that you really are issue spotting, not just the stuff that happens all the time, but the issues that only come up some of the time. And therefore, you might be more likely to forget about it or to not take it into account in your research. I'll give you an example. Um, when I was practicing, I did a lot of summary judgment motions. I mean, I, I did a lot of them. And so I knew that procedure cold. I knew it really, really well. Um, and so I could have just assumed, okay, let me use a template from my last summary judgment motion. I don't need to go back to the practice guide and read the chapter on summary judgment procedure. But I really think that that's the wrong way to look at it because every motion is a little different. The facts are different. Um, different issues arise. And so taking a quick scan through the chapter on what are the requirements and what are the procedural issues on a summary judgment motion give me a really quick way of running through that mental checklist and saying, okay, that issue, that wasn't a problem last time, but it might be this time. So let me stop an issue spot and make sure that I'm not missing anything. Thank you. Um, you just, you know, did a great sample search under uh, a primary law search. Do you use key terms and phrase searches within secondary sources as well? Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, I think the I think the logic for kind of what what you're searching for is true across types of content that you're searching. Um, it really depends on what you're looking for. Um, now. Sometimes, though, if you have a long search term and you're searching secondary sources and you don't get as many results back, that might be just a factor of um, the truth that there is a huge volume of case law out there. California puts out a flood of case law basically every day. And things are always changing. So the volume of case law is exponentially bigger than the volume of secondary sources. But I think it's generally a good rule of thumb to use alternate phrases, um, to use a, uh, a good natural language search with whether you're searching secondary sources or primary law. And if you don't get back exactly what you want, adjust from there. But I think that's always a good place to start. Great. And before we move on to the next section, let's answer two more questions. In a natural mm -hmm. language search, do you leave out connectors such as and? And how important are quotation marks around phrases? Uh, great questions. So the I do usually leave out terms and connectors, uh, especially for natural language, because it doesn't. Those words don't really give the search engine any as much to work with, because those those words and phrases are kind of ubiquitous. Um, if the exception to that is if the word and is part of a term of art. So, for example, um, in criminal law, search and seizure is a term of art that is used a lot. So I would probably type in search and seizure as is because that's part of the term of art. But if I was searching, you know, uh, search and seizure motion to suppress evidence, I probably wouldn't put in search and seizure and motion to suppress. Um, so that's kind of how I would, I would approach that. Um, when it comes to quotation marks, you don't really, so quotation marks are, gets you exact phrasing. Um, do you want to find the exact phrase inside your quotation marks? And usually for natural language, I don't, I don't insert those. And the reason for that is, is that 
you may again inadvertently eliminate relevant results if if the document doesn't have that exact phrase, but it has a very similar phrase in it that's still relevant. So not including the um, quotation marks will sometimes get you um, results that you would have otherwise not seen. And as I said before, now legal search engines are on the whole pretty good at recognizing specific legal concepts. So you don't necessarily need quotation marks for your search engine to know what you're talking about, basically, and to recognize, uh, recognize the concept. All right, so let's move on to talking a little bit more about um, citators and primary law. So what exactly do I mean by a citator? Well, I mean, a citator is a tool that uses color-coded flags or other visual indicators to tell you very quickly whether or not a case is still good law or whether it has some negative subsequent history that makes it problematic for you to rely on it or to use it in a memo or a brief or to rely on it in your analysis. It's basically the same thing as uh, shepherdizing in Lexis or using Keysight if you're in Westlaw. You're checking the subsequent history of the case to make sure that it is still good law. Um, and similar to what we discussed regarding Boolean terms and connectors versus natural language, I think the most important thing to keep in mind for using a case law citator is understanding the tool that you have and understanding that not all citators are the same. Um, there are gaps and limitations to some citators and you just have to know what you've got. And when you are building a citator, there are some choices that the team building it has to make. And one of those choices is whether you're going to rely on computer review alone or whether you're also going to take into account kind of human expert review by lawyers for the case. And the best results and the most accurate and nuanced citators you will find if your citator uses a combination of a high quality computer algorithm plus human review where a lawyer with subject matter expertise is also reviewing the case and making sure that everything is accurate. Um, so number one, just know what you've got and know what the limitations of your particular citator are. Um, the second one is really understanding what the flags mean. The visual indicators are different in every single system. Um, the red flag might mean slightly different things in different systems, and a red flag might not necessarily mean you can't or shouldn't use the case, depending on your circumstances. Um, I think a lot of lawyers, because they want to make sure that they are citing highly relevant cases, will frequently just eliminate any case with a orange or a red flag immediately without looking at them. And I used to do that too, honestly, because I wanted to make sure that there was just no question about whether or not um, I was relying on good law. But the fact of the matter is, especially if there aren't other cases um, that support the point you're trying to make, if the red flag indicator is talking about a completely different issue <laughs> than the one you're relying on the case for, you could probably still use it and you probably should, especially if it's directly on point. So we'll get into that a little bit more when I pull up the demo. Um, and the last thing tip that I want to give people on using um, primary law search and, and using citators is use the filters that you're given. In a lot of systems, lawyers don't use really valuable filters that they're given to narrow and refine um, a long list of cases to get the ones that are most meaningful to them. And what you need to understand is that in order to implement filters and a filter system, a lot of really hard work has to happen behind the scenes to analyze and tag that content to make the filters useful. So rely on all that hard work and use it. You're, you're paying for the tool. You might as well use all the features and functions that it has to offer. So here I have my uh, page of search results, my primary law search results. Um, that we had up before using the natural language search. So uh, let's just look at this first case as an example, the Faust versus California Portland Cement Company case. Um, so there's this, this uh, yellow-orange caution flag. And so you might think, oh, God, I don't dare use this. 
there's a caution flag, but you have to understand what that caution flag means. And here, it tells me pretty quickly and easily the caution flag just means that this case has been factually distinguished by another case, meaning the law that the case applies is still good, but the more case is saying our facts are different than Faust, so we are going to distinguish it factually. So unless that's an issue for you, Faust is probably still fair game to use. Um, the other thing that it's telling me here, if I want to rely on Faust, is that there are 95 cases subsequent that are citing to the Faust case. So if I want to do research on that subsequent history and see what these other later cases have said about Faust, I can pull up that list. But 95 cases is a lot to sort through. So this is where the filters come in. Um, you need to look to see what tools you have to narrow your results. And here, let's say the first thing I want to do is say only publish cases. So now I've gone from 95 down to 19. And let's say that I'm doing this research because I'm drafting a summary judgment motion. So I probably want to see the cases citing Faust that are also summary judgment cases and are talking about Faust in the same context. So I'm going to limit the cases to summary judgment down to 14. And let's say because of the search we're doing that I only want to see cases that are dealing with retaliation and wrongful discharge causes of action. Because again, that's the fact pattern that I'm interested in here. And that's, that's what I'm doing. So now I'm all the way down to nine cases instead of 95, which really is going to save me time and limit, limit the scope of the research that I'm doing. And I can also have a pretty high degree of confidence that these nine cases are the ones that are most similar to mine. So if I want to rely on Faust, I want to see how these other similar cases that are similar to mine are talking about the Faust case. Um, so that, I think, is a pretty good example of using filters and using the tools that you're given in your research tool. Um, a lot of people skip that little left-hand column, and they don't really look at all the features and functionality that they have. I think it's especially valuable when dealing with primary law because um, it's a big sea of cases out there, like we talked about before, uh, new cases every day. And using the filters is a really great way to be able to just narrow the scope of what you're looking at in an effective way. And um, before I move on, any, any questions about any of that that we've gotten about primary law, about citators? Yeah, um, Stephanie, um, how would one know if there's lawyers reviewing the cases? I know CEB has that, but how would, how would others who are using other legal research platforms know? Yeah, it's a really good question. Um, I think there's no easy way to know. Um, sometimes, a lot of times, if systems do have it, they'll advertise it or have some verbiage in how they talk about their citator to that effect. Um, sometimes you can get a clue in the name of the citator itself if it kind of has like a computer-ish name. Um, but honestly, sometimes you, you could ask. If you're vetting, if you're vetting products or if you're thinking about switching systems, um, there's nothing wrong with asking the details about how, how exactly does this work and what does it do and what does it not do. Mm -hmm. And a little while ago, you were talking about all the different filters and how everyone should take advantage of them since they're paying for them. Um, can you give us some examples of filters that are available? Well, I can't tell you for every single system that's out there um, what filters are and are not available. You, you'll have to look and see for your particular research tool. Um, I can show, I mean, obviously what's on the screen here are filters that we make available um, for CEB for cases in that uh, instance. Um, you can limit by court, and uh, if you want to search only cases in the second district, again, you can. I really like being able to filter by cause of action and procedural posture. I think that's highly useful. Um, but depending on the type of resource that you're searching, for instance, secondary sources, primary law, or something else, and depending on the system you have, there probably will be different filters. A lot of um, so you you just have to do a little research and see what's what's available to you. Um, but I think really at the end of the day, you should look to see what is available to you because uh, regardless of what's there, I guarantee it's underused. 
Okay. So the last thing I wanted to talk about today was uh, free versus paid resources. So um, I am not going to be the girl who tells you not to use them <laughs> because if I did, I would be a giant hypocrite. Um, I used uh, free resources all the time when I was uh, when I was practicing. You, I used Google, I used Wikipedia, I used news blogs, legal blogs, uh, just like industry industry resources for particular clients. Um, they're great, and you can get a lot of really great context for them. But I do think that you should understand how free resources fit into the bigger picture of your legal research plan and what you're trying to do. Because relying solely on free um, resources is frequently a bad idea because unfortunately you get what you pay for and you'll probably miss a lot of really useful information analysis and nuance but augmenting your legal research with free resources and knowing how to do that and when is a great idea so this is how i think about the utility of free resources i think it can really do these things really well first it can help you understand new developments um, if there is a new, brand new case that just popped up, or if there's unanswered questions in the law, you're not going to get analysis in your secondary sources dealing with that issue because the case is too new or the question's unanswered. But what you might get is a expert in a legal blog somewhere giving a really highly valuable nuanced opinion about how this new case might shake out or how they anticipate the, the, the courts uh, interpreting a new statute. And you can get really great, really useful information to kind of help you issue spot and frame the issues for new developments. Um, and I think a very, very, very useful thing to use free resources for is getting the client's perspective. Um, we are at the end of the day service providers as lawyers. We have to do a service for a client. And I still run into a significant number of lawyers who think that their only main job is to tell their client the right answer from the legal perspective. And they don't really take into account the way they should the client's either personal or business motivations for what they care about and what they're trying to accomplish. Um, so if you only look at purely legal resources and you don't read the news, and you don't look at how kind of industry professionals in your client's industry are looking at things, or if you don't get that human perspective, you're likely to miss the core concerns that your clients have, and you're going to be less able to address those concerns effectively and to link those business concerns or personal concerns with a sound legal strategy. So I really think that reading news articles and legal blogs and industry blogs and staying abreast of um, the news is a great way of keeping the client perspective in mind. Um, it's also a great way to get information on niche legal topics that you might not have coverage of. Um, my favorite example that I always give for this is that I had one case, one case, where I had to learn about admiralty law and how to arrest a vessel, which is not something that I ever had to do before or since. And obviously, my firm didn't have any resources on admiralty law or how to arrest a vessel. We weren't going to invest in them because it was a one-time issue that was not going to repeat itself. But then go to your local law library, go back to your law school library, go to your county law library, um, look up free articles on the internet, you know, do what you can to get coverage of that niche issue um, without having to pay for it. I think that's 100% fine and completely reasonable. But so I think using free resources to augment your other legal research plan is a really great way to go. Um, and going back to this first point about understanding new developments, here's kind of an example of what I mean. This was an article that we put out, I think, yeah, April, back in April, talking about how the coronavirus is presenting new issues for residential landlords and tenants. So if I'm a real property lawyer and I'm representing either residential landlords or tenants, a lot of these questions are brand new and there aren't answers for them yet. And we don't know how these issues are going to shake out. 
but this article was still highly useful in just issue spotting for me. Some of the things that I might want to talk to my clients about um, to see if it's a concern, if it's an issue at their particular property, so I can start brainstorming what to do about them. Because even though there might not be an answer about how do I tackle any of these issues, because they're all so new, you can't do anything to address the issues if you don't know that they exist. So a lot of times legal blogs and topical articles can do a really, really fantastic job of issue spotting and just making you aware of new issues that you didn't even know existed. Well, that's actually all I've got <laughs> at the moment. So if anyone does have any last minute questions, please send them now and I'm sure Kelly will tell me what they are. Um, otherwise, we'll give you back the rest of your lunch hour and your day. Um, are you seeing anything pop in, Kelly? Yes. Um, how do you feel about Google speaking of free resources? <laughs> Okay, so I actually love Google. <laughs> um, I, I, think, I think it really depends on what you're trying to get out of it. Obviously, if you're using Google Scholar to look up cases, you're not going to get very far because, because it doesn't have any of the tagging or any of the citator information or any of the advanced filters that you're going to get in another system. So if you're looking to do serious case law research, Google Scholar is not a great option. Um, conversely, <laughs> regular Google, um, I mean, I think it's a, it's a really good search engine. And so I think it depends on what you're looking for. You're not going to find really in-depth legal analysis on Google because um, that lives in legal research databases like CEB, like Westlaw, like any number of legal databases that are out there. However, when it comes to just finding basic information or uh, frame or legal news articles or blogs or look, I, I have absolutely been in the situation where a new concept came up and I had no idea what it meant. And so I Googled it and I looked at the Wikipedia page first, but I didn't stop there and only rely on the Wikipedia page. What the Wikipedia page does is give you a little bit of a framework for understanding what you're looking at. And then you know enough to go into a legal search engine and do a more serious and more targeted search. Mm -hmm. So I love and Google. I adore it, but it can't be the only thing that you use. <laughs> Here, here's a great question. Um, do you have any thoughts on how to check the accuracy of those free resources? <laughs> I think that's the problem is that there's no good way to do it and to do it seriously would be so time consuming that it's a waste of time and money. I mean, there, there isn't really a great way to check accuracy. The only way you can do that is to cross reference it against other materials and you probably might not have a lot of materials that would really give you an accurate view of those free resources. And so I think, Unfortunately, there's no real good way to do it. You, when it comes to legal blogs and legal news sites, you just have to kind of find some that you think are reputable and that seem to do a good job and that seem to have high quality analysis. That I think you can just gut check yourself on. You know, is this person thoughtful and giving me good analysis? But, um, mm -hmm. but other than that, it, 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 is, it is difficult. It is difficult to vet, and that's part of why free resources can be really problematic. Mm -hmm. And what is your strategy for knowing when to stop your research versus continuing to look for more and more information? Um, that is an excellent question, and I think partially that is something that every lawyer just has to get your own kind of feeling on. But a couple of the things that I do is if you have a list of the issues that you're actually trying to research written down on a piece of paper so that you can refer to them. Um, and if you start to notice that your research is sending you far afield or the issues that or tangents that you've gone off um, are not really directly applicable to the core questions that you're researching or that you meant to research, maybe that's a sign that you're, you're, you should turn around and go back. I think another good way to look at it is if you are 
doing a few well-crafted legal searches and you start to find um, repeat resources, if you start seeing the same cases over and over again, and you start seeing the same um, the same results in secondary sources searching two or three different ways, that's a good signal that you're that you're you're finding you're not missing much. When you when you start finding repeat duplicate responses, that's actually a good thing. A lot of a lot of the time. Mm -hmm. And are you familiar with um, FindLaw.com for researching cases and codes? Only very, very vaguely, um, you know, like only very vaguely. I, I don't, I haven't used it uh, extensively, so I can't probably talk at length about it. Uh, and what are you, well, you, you mentioned about, you know, keeping a written log of your research. Um, mm -hmm. Do you have any suggestions or tips on how to keep a written log of your research? Um, sure. I think, I mean, I don't. I think whatever works for you and makes sense to your thought process is a good idea. Um, one way that I used to like to do it was to have kind of as a major heading um, the general topic that I was researching. And then underneath that, uh, just like a, a very brief list of the major, um, either the major practice guides or chapters that I, I had already looked at or for cases um, just a list of the highly relevant major cases that I was finding. But I, I personally found it useful to do it topically. So um, I might have, you know, if part of my research is substantive, where I'm looking at a substantive legal issue and part of my research is procedural, maybe I have um, two different sections of the paper or two different sheets of the paper, one for the procedural research and one for the kind of topical employment law specific research. Mm -hmm. And what do you, or I guess you'd be uh, used for daily published cases? As in, where do we get them? Or what do we use? I mean, I, I can't get into all the details, but I will, what I can say is that CEB gets new case law on a daily basis um, and work really hard to keep things up to date. So um, everybody uses a slightly different way of getting cases. Obviously, I can't talk about other entities and what they do, but for us, what we focus on is just making sure that we have a highly reliable, um, consistent, timely feed for to analyze and to, and to feed the Citator tool. Mm 